Chapter twenty eight of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter twenty eight. The flight. About ten days after Ralph's return to Flat Creek, things came to a crisis. The master was rather relieved at first to have the crisis come. He had been holding juvenile Flat Creek under his feet by sheer force of will. And such an exercise of psychic power is very exhausting. In racing on the Ohio, the engineer sometimes sends the largest of the firemen to hold the safety valve down, and this he does by hanging himself to the lever by his hands. Ralph felt that he had been holding the safety valve down, and that he was so weary of the operation that an explosion would be a real relief. He was a little tired of having everybody look on him as a thief. It was a little irksome to know that new bolts were put on the doors of the houses in which he had stayed. And now that Shocky was gone, and Bud had turned against him, and Aunt Matilda suspected him, and even poor, weak, exquisite Walter Johnson would not associate with him, he felt himself an outlaw indeed. He would have gone away to Texas, or the new gold fields in California, had it not been for one thing— that letter on blue fool's cap paper kept a little warmth in his heart. His course from school on the evening that something happened lay through the sugar camp. Among the dark trunks of the maples, solemn and lofty pillars, he debated the case. To stay or to flee. The worn nerves could not keep their present tension much longer. It was just by the brook, or, as they say in Indiana, the branch, that something happened, which brought him to a sudden decision. Ralph never afterward could forget that brook. It was a swift-running little stream that did not babble blatantly over the stones. It ran through a thicket of willows, through the sugar camp, and out into Means's pasture. Ralph had just passed through the thicket, had just crossed the brook on the half-decayed law that spanned it, when, as he emerged from the water willows on the other side, he started with a sudden shock. For there was Hannah, with a white, white face, holding out a little note folded like an old-fashioned thumb-paper. "'Go, quick!' she stammered, as she slipped it into Ralph's hand, inadvertently touching his fingers with her own, a touch that went tingling through the schoolmaster's nerves. But she had hardly said the words until she was gone down the brookside path and over into the pasture. A few minutes afterward she drove the cows up into the lot and meekly took her scolding from Mrs. Means for being gone such an awful long time, like a lazy good-for-nothing piece of goods that she was. Ralph opened the thumb-paper note, written on a page torn from an old copy-book, in Bud's handwrite, and running, Mr. Hartsook, Dear Sir, I put in my best licks. Tain't no use. Run for your life. A plan's on foot to tar and feather or wuss to-night. Go right off. Things is awful juberous. Bud. The first question, with Rolf, was whether he could depend on Bud. But he soon made up his mind that treachery of any sort was not one of his traits. He had mourned over the destruction of Bud's good resolutions by Martha Hawkins' refusal, and being a disinterested party, he could have comforted Bud by explaining Martha's mitten but he felt sure that Bud was not treacherous. It was a relief, then, as he stood there, to know that the false truce was over, and worst had come to worst. His first impulse was to stay and fight, but his nerves were not strong enough to execute so foolhardy a resolution. He seemed to see a man behind every maple trunk. Darkness was fast coming on, and he knew that his absence from supper at his boarding-place could not fail to excite suspicion. There was no time to be lost. So he started. Once run from a danger, and panic is apt to ensue. The forest, the stock fields, the dark hollows through which he passed, seemed to be peopled with terrors. He knew Small and Jones well enough to know that every avenue of escape would be carefully picketed. So there was nothing to do but to take the shortest path to the old trysting place, the spring and rock. Here he sat and shook with terror. Angry with himself, he plainly denounced himself for a coward. But the effect was really a physical one. The chill and panic now were the reaction from the previous stain. For when the sound of his pursuers broke upon his ears early in the evening, Ralph shook no more, 
The warm blood set back again toward the extremities, and his self-control returned when he needed it. He gathered some stones about him as the only weapons of defense at hand. The mob was on the cliff above, but he thought that he heard footsteps in the bed of the creek below. If this were so, there could be no doubt that his hiding place was suspected. "'Oh, Hank!' shouted Bud, from the top of the cliff to someone in the creek below. "'Be sure to look at the spring in rock. I think he's there.' This hint was not lost on Rolf, who speedily changed his quarters by climbing up to a secluded shelf-like ledge above the spring. He was none too soon, for Pete Jones and Hank Banta were soon looking all around the spring for him, while he held a twenty-pound stone over their heads ready to drop upon them, in case they should think of looking on the ledge above. When the crowd were gone, Rolf knew that one road was open to him. He could follow down the creek to Clifty, and thence he might escape but travelling down to Clifty, he debated whether it was best to escape. To flee was to confess his guilt, to make himself an outlaw, to put an insurmountable barrier between himself and Hannah, whose terror-stricken and anxious face as she stood by the brook willows haunted him now, and was an involuntary witness to her love. Long before he reached Clifty his mind was made up not to flee another mile. He knocked at the door of Squire Underwood, but Squire Underwood was also a doctor, and had been called away. He knocked at the door of Squire Doolittle, but Squire Doolittle had gone to Lewisburg. He was about to give up all hope of being able to surrender himself to the law when he met Squire Hawkins, who had come over to Clifty to avoid responsibility for the ill deeds of his neighbors which he was powerless to prevent. "'Is that you, Mr. Hartsook?' "'Yes, and I want you to arrest me and try me here in Clifty.' End of chapter 28